we know that his name is certainly worthy not only of honor and praise but also glory there's there's wonder there's miracle working power there's just simply power and redemption in the name of Jesus that name that rises above all names and we give him glory on today I'm going to call your attention to the book of Joshua chapter 1 you'll notice that we are say fast forwarding but we're moving forward a few books we'll certainly bridge the gap uh, so that we know where we are. Amen? Uh, how many of you are bringing your Bibles each and every Sunday? Amen? Amen? Amen. Reading along with us. Amen? Uh, through our series. Joshua 1, beginning verse uh, number 1. It says, Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass, the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. And verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide an inheritance in the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right nor to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, and thou, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Finally, verse 9, Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever Amen. thou goest. Father in heaven, we give praise and thanks and honor and glory unto thee. For Father in heaven, we know that from heaven you've given your word. And O oh God, as you've spoken, we listen, we are attentive. And Father, we pray that your manner which comes from heaven spiritually would impart truth to our heart, that it might impart conviction to the unsaved, that it might impart encouragement and building of faith to those who are redeemed. Father, we proclaim and thank you for your word. Father, we stand today as earthen vessels through which your mighty power goes forth. We pray, God, for faithfulness and fidelity as we rightly divide the word of truth, that it might give sustenance, that it might give hope and encouragement to those who are under our listening ear. Father, we praise you. We honor and glorify you for your word. In Jesus' name, church, say amen. amen. As you are seated, I would that you would consider for our subject this morning, limitless possibilities. Limitless possibilities. My brothers and sisters, you'll notice that we are making a transition from the book of Exodus uh, to the book of Joshua. Uh, in making that transition in our series, we are leapfrogging uh, the last three books of the Torah, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I want us to understand that when we uh, go through the book of Exodus, we'll discover that not only uh, is Moses on the scene as a leader, and uh, not only does Moses lead and does God deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt and they cross the Red Sea, uh, not only do they praise God as they go through the wilderness, they murmur, they complain, uh, they show their human frailties in the wilderness. 
We also notice in Exodus 25 that God uh, begins to lay down some rules and instructions for a tabernacle, a place where God's glory might dwell. And God begins to, very specifically through Moses, even in chapter 19 rather, uh, to lay out uh, his moral law and then begins to lay out his ceremonial, ceremonial laws. And so when we get into the book of Leviticus, we find that God, through uh, Moses, begins to add some very specifics to the ceremonial law. So we see Leviticus basically builds upon some specifics that we find in the book of Deuteronomy. When we get to the book of Numbers, we find that, that it is basically a census word numbers, in order that God may be helping us to see how many it was in each one of the tribes that were still in existence while they were wandering in the wilderness, because God is very uh, accurate when it comes to keeping an account of his people, but God wants us to see how many came out of Egypt, uh, how many because of unfaithfulness wound up not only wandering in the wilderness, but also perishing in the wilderness. But then we also have a sense count to see how many would actually go in and populate the promised land. Thus we have the book of Numbers. Then we have the book of Deuteronomy, which literally means second law or second giving of the law. Meaning that the law was given the first time in the book of Exodus, but because of the murmuring and complaining, most of the first generation who actually heard the giving of the law of Moses at the mountain were no longer living. And so God who did not hear or were not present or had not been born. Y'all going to pray with me here today. Because God is preparing them to go into the promised land. And so we see a transition from the Torah or the books of the law, or the book of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, into the books of history. We not only see a transition in books, but we also see a transition in leadership. And the reason why we see this transition in leadership is because God wants us to understand that human personalities will pass off the scene, but there will always be continuity with the plan of God. In other words, just because there is a new leader does not mean there is a new vision. Any leader that is leading folk on behalf of God who comes up with a vision that is different than what God has already said. Are y'all going to pray with me here today? There's a transition in human personality, but the visionary is eternal. You see, we get in trouble when we try to come up with our own vision. Now, if you're working for IBM or Xerox, or one of these companies, you need to come up with a vision. But when you are serving the Lord, you don't come up with a vision. God has already laid out his plan in the word of God. And from Genesis to Revelation, even to 2013, God selects and equips leaders to carry out a vision that does not change. So the work of God goes on as God has designated. So we see a transition from the books of Moses to the books of history. We'll also see something that is very connective because uh, the books of Joshua, through the books of Second Chronicles, we find that each one of the books begins with a connective word. In other words, depending on your translation, as you read Joshua through Second Chronicles, you will notice in these nine books, each books, book, excuse me, either begins with the word now, after, or and. These words, now, after, or and, are connective words, implying that the books of Joshua through 2 Chronicles are connective in nature. God has formed the people, and now God is unfolding the history of these people in uh, the promised land that he has given them. So, we literally begin to see, my brothers and sisters, that as we go through the books of Moses, that Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they bridge the gap that help us to move into Joshua. Joshua serves as a bridging of the gap that leads us into the next portion of uh, the word of God. For most of us, the most familiar passage of Joshua is Joshua 24 and verse 15, where Joshua gives us the premise of his life and his lifestyle. He gives us the premise of his faithfulness to God. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
Joshua also gives us something, some insight on something that many of us in the world are seeking after, and many are seeking after success. But Joshua helps us to understand that for the believer, success is not something that is sought. Success is something that is given by God. You see, as believers, as we faithfully follow the plan of God, success is not something we seek. Success is something that God gives us as we are seeking God. As believers, we don't seek accomplishment, we seek God. And in our seeking God, we reap accomplishment. As a church, we don't seek results, we seek God, and God gives results. As a body of believers, we don't seek success, we seek God, and God gives success. So Joshua gives us a strategy for success. But Joshua not only gives us a strategy for success, but he also helps us to understand that we don't need to think that it's all about us. See, a whole lot of folk, they, they won't carry on with the continuity of God's plan. Because if we think that if we carry on the continuity of a plan that was being carried on by another leader, then we ourselves won't get any glory. And so we say, since I'm in position now, I've got to come up with my own agenda. Somebody pray with me here today. In order that folk will know that me, myself, and I came up with this. But notice Joshua never felt overshadowed by his success. A lot of preachers get in the church and try to do away with everything that the previous leader did. Y'all gonna pray with me here today. But we'll understand here that when, when Joshua comes on the scene, uh, he does not allow himself to be overshadowed by his successor. Francis Schaeffer called the book of Joshua a bridge book, much like the book of Acts is a bridge between the Gospels and the letters. Uh, the book of Acts tells us about the faith, the life, problems of the church. Joshua is a bridge book that tells us about the faith, the life, and the problems of the children of Israel. It again is a book of continuities. It helps us to understand, my brothers and sisters, that God continues to unfold his plan and promises through his people. And so my brothers and sisters, I am convinced, and I hope that you will be convinced through this message today, that there are some lessons in Joshua that very much are needed for our time. As we have gone through our series, I've often made it a point, particularly when we move into a new book, to point out some significant first in the Bible. And the significant first we notice with Joshua is that Joshua is the first book in the Bible named after an individual. And it's quite arresting that the book of Joshua would be the first book in the Bible named after an individual who, for the most part, prior to him is pretty anonymous within the wanderings of the children of Israel. The choir saying, be thou faithful over a few things. The song did not say try to make a name for yourself and God will raise you up. And so we find this very anonymous individual who is barely mentioned during the sojournings and leadership of Moses. But when we carefully scrutinize this text, we will find that he was one of the most faithful, not only to God, but also Moses, who was never concerned about getting credit. And so the man who was never concerned about being getting credit winds up being the first person in the Bible who has his name born in a book. It is interesting, my brothers and sisters, as James Montgomery Boy says, that of all of the characters in history, we'll find that the books of Moses deal with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, but none of the books bear their name. The first book bearing a name is that of Joshua. And Philip Keller says, and I quote, that the life of Joshua, his entire life, was a straightforward story of simply setting down one foot after another in quiet compliance with the word of God. Now that's a strategy or a key to success that many of y'all missed. Success in your spiritual life is step-by-step step compliance 
with the word of God. We must understand, my brothers and sisters, that we've got a step-by-step -step walk with the Lord. I saw a very interesting story, and it came to mind as I was preparing this sermon uh, on the book of Joshua. Uh, there was a television program that preceded uh, the 1988 Winter Olympics, and uh, in this particular story, uh, it featured some blind skiers. I want you to know something. I've never skied. Amen. <laughs> and I can, I can see a little bit, but I can't imagine trying to ski blind. But it noticed there were some blind skiers, and they were being uh, trained for, for slalom skiing. And it sounds, and I know it sounds to you, to be quite impossible that, that blind skiers could do some slalom skiing, but, but they were paired with sighted skiers. Uh, the blind skiers were paired with sighted skiers and they were taught on the flatlands how to make right and left turns. Uh, when they mastered that, they were taken to the slopes and when their sighted partners were skiing behind them, they would shout to them left and right. Now the blind skiers were going down the slope. They could not see where they were going, but they trusted the sighted skiers to say left or right. And every time the sighted skiers said left or right, they didn't delay. Because when somebody say left, that means you need to turn. If you keep on going, then turn left, you might run into a tree. Somebody, don't pray with me. So Joshua was one that knew he was spiritually blind. And step by step, he allowed the man with sight oh, yeah. to say, cross over. Yes. Stop here for three days. Now go forward. Yes. Go around this mountain. See, a lot of us, we follow the word of God and the will of God in a delay. God said to stop two days ago. God said to go forward three days ago. Y'all going to pray with me here today. God said turn left a week ago. God said right a year ago. Now we're trying to do in a delayed fashion what God said to do a long time ago, but non-compliance when God says to do it immediately amounts to disobedience, and when you strike out after God has passed, you will not be successful. So Moses illustrates for us that compliance with God must come Immediately. Now, now you need to notice in Deuteronomy chapter 27, as we connect and bridge the gap, God tells the children of Israel, I want you to take some stones. And he says, when you get over to this promised land that I'm giving you, I want you to uh, write all of the instructions that I've given. And I want you to place the instructions that deal with blessings on Mount Gerizim and the instructions that deal with cursing on Mount Ebal. Now understand that Mount, uh, Mount Ebal is north of Shechem, Mount Gerizim of Shouse of Shechem. And God tells them in Deuteronomy chapter 27, I want you to write all of the instructions. And he says, I want you to put them on stones that are made not with tools, but are just natural stones. Now you need to understand, God does not want them to take stones and rocks to write the word of God on that are made with stones or tools that have been cut by man's hands. The reason being is God wants them to understand this has nothing to do with man. Man has nothing to do with it. And so God says, I want the children of Israel by tribe, there are 12 tribes. I want six tribes on one mountain, six tribes on the other. Six of the tribes will represent the blessings that will come from Mount Gerizim. Six of the tribes will represent the cursings that will come from Mount Ebal. Now y'all gonna pray with me here today. And Joshua being a careful listener to God as Moses dies and as God puts Joshua on the scene, God says, Moses, I'm elevating you to the position of leadership. Now you remember I said that on two mountains my law must go before the people, that they must be focused on my law and on my word. And so Joshua is carrying out the plan of God. With the commands of God, we find that a major point of Joshua is that God's purposes do not change even though people change. The choir helped us as they say that God's purpose in the book of Joshua is that as we are faithful in small things, God leads us to bigger things. Joshua also helps us to see that with God, our 
potential is literally unlimited. Because verse 3 he says that wherever your foot shall walk and tread, it shall belong to you. We also see how God uses obedience and faith and how God allows us to walk in destiny. And so I just want to point out a few things before I take my seat. Some lessons we learn from Joshua. The first lesson we learn from Joshua is that God, my brothers and sisters, builds on the past. The Bible says that, that Moses is dead and Joshua is in a position of leadership. And we see that God not only builds on past leadership, but God also builds on our past. God builds on the past of Joshua. Warren Wiersbe reminds us as we look and see the history of this man Joshua, that Joshua was the firstborn son of a man uh, who lived in Nun. Now Joshua being the firstborn son and being much younger than Moses would have been vulnerable during the time of the Passover. Because God said every firstborn are y'all going to pray with me here today? Must be struck down. And so Joshua historically was living a life that was based literally not just on national deliverance, but personal deliverance. Is somebody going to pray with me here today? Joshua himself had been personally delivered, being a firstborn. And so we see the building blocks uh, in a life that God is creating and understanding that our lives, and we see this through the life of Joshua, they are not dependent upon random chance or human will, but our lives are dependent on a purposeful life. And Joshua was living a purposeful life. But then secondly, we see that as followers of the Lord, we must seize moments to be faithful. Oftentimes when God presents moments in order for us to show our fidelity and faithfulness to him, we do not seize these moments. It is a basic principle. If you are faithful in something small, God will entrust you with more. Remember I said that Joshua remains relatively anonymous, but we find in the book of Joshua, uh, excuse me, we find in the life of Joshua, first of all, Joshua is first of all mentioned in Exodus chapter 17 when the children of Israel have been complaining and murmuring about water and about food. We find in Exodus 17 at Rephidim, the children of Israel are about to get into a battle with the Amalekites. And the Bible says that a little known soldier who had no rank in the military literally stood forward with everybody else complaining said I don't need any medals I don't need any stripes but I will be the military commander that was Joshua Joshua led the children of Israel to defeat Amalek in Exodus chapter 17. In Numbers chapter 13 and 14, Moses said, I need some spies to go out and spy out the land. Twelve spies went. One of them was Joshua. Joshua did not say, that's too little of a job for me to do. Joshua said, whatever the leader wants me to do, I'll go and do. So the 12 spies went and spied out the land. Ten of them came back with a bad report. But Caleb and Joshua came back with a faithful report and said, let us go and get the land that God has promised. But then when we go back to our lesson from last week, from Exodus chapter 33, we'll discover, my brothers and sisters, as the children of Israel were experiencing the glory of the Lord. It says in that same text that Moses would meet God in the tent of meeting. And in Exodus 33 and 11, it says that when Moses had met God at the tent of meeting, and Moses came out and asked the Lord, after having seen his glory, show me your glory. Exodus 33 and 11 says that there was a man by the name of Joshua who said, Moses, I'll stand here and guard the tent yes. while you go and do the work for the Lord. Is somebody going to pray with me here today? Moses said, I, I don't need a significant job. Uh, Joshua, excuse me. He said in Exodus 33 and 11, I'll stay here. In other words, seize moments and opportunities to be faithful. Yes. 
and God will elevate you. We also see through the life of Joshua that Joshua had obedience that goes the distance. Because as we go all the way through the book of Joshua, we come to 24 and verse 15. And Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will remain faithful to the Lord. We also see in the book of Joshua that God's presence is something that's very important, my brothers and sisters. Because we need more than a strategic plan. We need God. God is not giving us a gift. He is giving us himself. I want to help a lot of us as leaders. We can take the guesswork and the strategizing out of how to try to run the church. Because God is, is not asking us to run the church. God is not asking us to come up with a strategic plan. God is not asking us to come up with a vision. God says, I'll give you me. And when you come to me, I will give you the plan. So many of us are having powwows and retreats and everything else trying to figure out what God wants us to do. God wants to do the same thing he's been telling us to do ever since he said in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. God's problem is, and the reason why we don't have any results, are y'all going to pray for me here today, is because we won't do what he told us to do. And so God says, and we need to understand that our big, biggest obstacles are not the hurdles and problems we face, but the temptations we can often have to try to jump over them all by ourselves. The reason why we try to jump over them all by ourselves is because as God was telling Moses over and over again, I'll go with you. We don't have a sense of God's presence. We don't have a God mindset. And the church is in the predicament across the country and the world uh, that it is in today is because there are too many people in the church who do not have a God mindset. Roger Van Eck in a book entitled A Kick in the Seat of the Pants. He says if you take, he, he, he did an illustration one time during a workshop and a seminar and said he told the people that were in the workshop, I want you to take a look around the room. And as you are looking around the room and sitting, I want you to find five things that have blue in them. He said it again, I want you to find five things that had blue in them. So he created within them a blue mindset. And because he created within them a blue mindset, with a blue mindset, they found everything blue jumping out at them. Somebody saw a blue book on the table. Some saw a blue pillow on the couch. Somebody saw blue in a painting on the wall, and so on. In like fashion, whenever you buy a new car, you all of a sudden notice that you see that same car in the same color. Somebody pray with me tonight. Everywhere. That is because people find what they are looking for. A lot of folks say, I can't find or feel God's presence. That's because you're not looking for God. If I tell you to look for blue, you're going to find blue. Can somebody pray with me here today? If I tell you to look for every car that looks like yours, you're going to find every car that looks like yours. God told Joshua, look for me. And when you find me, you'll find out where to go. The church is never going to experience success. It ain't got nothing to do with the devil. It ain't got nothing to do with the government. It ain't got nothing to do with the economy. Y'all not going to pray with me here today. It ain't got nothing to do with the people in the church. It has to do with the fact that the people in the church need to find God. And when we find God, God will bring about his success. So Moses, excuse me, Joshua found God. And when he found God, he realized there are some limitless possibilities. My brothers and sisters, within the hands of God, God said that wherever your foot shall tread, wherever you go, whatever you do shall prosper. That speaks of limitless possibilities. But he said you must, and he reminds him three times, you must meditate on the law of God. Listen, day and night. Now many of us, we only meditate on the law of God at night. When trouble comes, we want to meditate on the law of God. When financial difficulty comes at night, we want to meditate and read the word of God. When, when, when diagnosis comes,
us. We want to meditate and read the Word of God. And then we wonder when we gravitate towards the Word of God, why is it that the Word of God is not producing results in our life? The Bible says you've got to meditate on the law of God day and night. When times are good and when times are not good. As a matter of fact, it is your meditating on the Word of God during the daytime experiences in your life that allow you to experience God's presence in the nighttime of life. If you don't know God before the lights go off. Many of us wind up being like we do at night time. If you don't know your house in the daytime, you certainly can't walk around your house. Somebody pray with me here today. At nighttime. Because it's during the daytime when you get your revelation. It's in the daytime that you get your illumination for the nighttime. So you won't stub, snub your spiritual toe. Hmm. Little girl. Bought a jewelry box, and the jewelry box came with a promise that said that the jewelry box would glow all night long. Little girl saved up her money, finally purchased the jewelry box that she hoped would glow all night long. But when she got home, she noticed that the jewelry box each and every night was not glowing all night long. So the little girl finally read the instructions, and the instructions said, if you hold me out in the sunshine all day, I'll glow all night. Somebody pray with me here today. Some of us trying to get holy and righteous in the nighttime experiences of our life, and we ain't been spending no time with God in the daytime. Somebody, somebody need to pray with me here today. You can't learn how to pray when trouble comes. You can't find the books of the Bible when, when trouble comes. You got to know. possibilities. The last thing I want to tell you, amen, is in verse number 10, we didn't read it, but in verse number 10 it says, Joshua gave order to the people and officers, grow through the camp, and give order to the people, get your supplies ready for, your, for yourselves, because in three days you will be crossing over the Jordan to enter the land. In three days. The number three in the Bible symbolizes the fulfillment of of God's plan. Number three, symbolizes the fulfillment, literally, of God's plan. Bob Mumford, in taking another look at guidance, compares discovering God's will with a sea captain that is navigating a ship and preparing to dock. But he said there was a certain harbor, he says, that you could only reach by sailing up a very narrow channel that would be very dangerous because of the rocks and because of the cliffs. And said, over the years, many ships had wrecked because they had failed to navigate this very dangerous and hazardous territory. And so in order to guide the ship to the port, there were three lights that were mounted on three huge, huge poles in the harbor. When the three lights are perfectly aligned up and seen as one, the ship can safely proceed up the narrow channel. The three individual lights, when they converge as one, following that one light will help you to sail up that hazardous channel. If the pilot sees two or three lights, he knows that if he goes, he'll be off course. Is somebody going to pray with me here today? And God has given us three beacons to guide us. The same rules of navigation apply. God has given us the word of God, yeah. which is his objective standard. He's given us the Holy Spirit, which is a subjective witness. He's given us circumstances, which is a divine providence. Right. But we also see that it took three days for the accomplishment of God's plan to come to fruition in the life of Jesus. Because the Bible says that Jesus, three days after being crucified, was raised from the grave. And God wants us to understand that God will always complete his plan in our life. But we've got to follow God as God tells us to go. Yes. Understand, my brothers and sisters, Joshua finally, as we close, Joshua helps all of us to know that new beginnings are possible. Yes. The children of Israel had failed miserably in the wilderness. And Moses
Moses has died and passed off the scene. But when we move into Joshua, we see that even in our failings, even in our murmurings, and even in our sin, that God is a God of new beginnings. The book of Joshua helps us to understand that, that God is able to bring us from out of our past. God is able to give us a new beginning. And so no matter what we've done in the wildernesses of our life, God still holds before us that great and precious promised land. Now notice he says that tell the people to make themselves ready because in three days we will cross over. Now understand that, that the way that we are made ready, we are made ready by the blood of Jesus who prepares us to cross over and leads us over into the new life. Literally, Joshua is a type or a figure of Christ. Yes. One who served as a leader of people over troubled water. And Jesus, we must understand, is the one who will lead you and I over the troubled waters of our life. If you are here today, and under the sound of my voice, and the troubled water in your life is seen, Christ is the only one who can bridge you over that trouble. As we stand, and I'm going to ask the deacons to come, as we extend the invitation of Christian disciples,